I want to uh, greet you, though, with is Happy New Life Day. Okay, not quite as clever maybe as uh, Dependence Day. We spoke on Independence Day, but uh, it'll have to do. What I pray today is that uh, we see Jesus through the eyes of Nicodemus and see our new life in a fresh way to see and if you haven't yet come to grasp this new life that Jesus offers that we see it as Nicodemus did Ah, oh, there we go we'll start off was something Jesus speaking to this Nicodemus. He says something rather curious. He says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And this is from, yes, amen, from uh, uh, John chapter 3, and we're going to go over uh, you know, 1 through 15, and then get to the famous John 3, 16. As you know that I'm want to do, we want to have a little bit of uh, historical perspective on this so that we can understand Nicodemus better. And uh, we'll go over a number of elements. I've been told that uh, I have until the ball drops today uh, to speak. So we have some time. We have some time to uh, you know, dig back into the history. And uh, get a glimpse of Passover, what that was all about. These 70 elders, a fiery serpent, or a venomous serpent, the split kingdom. And who were these Pharisees? You know, they, we have this impression of them, but who were they really? Passover. We need to go back further than that. Uh, we had Abraham. Abraham was called by God to leave his country and to follow God wherever he led. God gave him a promise that his children would fill the earth and that he would take the land that he was going to go to. Now, this promise that was made was when Abraham and his wife were old and they didn't have any children. But he held on to the promise. Then there was his son Isaac and then Jacob. And Jacob, there a lot that went on, had 12 sons and they had grown to a family of about 70. During a famine time, they came to Egypt. And there are whole messages around that. Over the years, this group of 70 Hebrews uh, multiplied. They thrived to, some believe, in, into the hundred or hundreds of thousands of people. Kind of intimidated uh, the Egyptians but what they did uh, was they commandeered the people, the Hebrew people, uh, for these massive building projects. Essentially, they were enslaved. They cry out to God. God sends Moses, and he inflicts on Pharaoh a series of plagues. 
culminating with one where the angel of death was to touch the firstborn male and the firstborn of the livestock. Unless, unless, they took a lamb, roasted it, ate it in haste, took the blood, painted the doorpost on the top and on the sides. Look familiar? They were told to, as time went by, to celebrate this Passover, this passing over of the angel of death through a series of preparation. And it was a week long, sometimes longer, uh, preparation where uh, you first got, uh, you got the house rid of uh, bread from yeast, but there were other things that you could, uh, and you, but it was as much a spiritual cleansing. And there, there were a number of ways where you could make yourself unclean for Passover and not be able to celebrate it. So you really tried to avoid those things, a uh, number of which including uh, you know, being in close contact with a non-Jewish person, a Gentile. Another, uh, touching a corpse, a dead body. You, you wanted to avoid those things. And so the celebration of Passover was carried on each year at a specified time. Fiery serpent, as they went on, they wandered. These people were delivered out of Egypt miraculously. They wandered in the desert. They were given this incredible food, this manna to live off of. And uh, incredible stuff, it would come down, you could do various things with it. And uh, they wandered. And as we turn to uh, Numbers 21, 4 through 8, and as we uh, think about the people and them wandering in the desert, uh, and as we read this account and other accounts, it's very easy for us to point fingers at uh, other people. Uh, but I uh, like to a lot of times where I see different people in scripture is to wonder whether God is holding up a mirror to me. And Rome, uh, Numbers 21, the bronze serpent. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water. And we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many of the people died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. 
it's thought that this pole was fashioned much like the cross. And the people prayed for the serpents to be taken away. The answer they were given was that look and live. Boy, can't we be like that at times where uh, God's providing and we still grumble. We still grumble. Uh, The people made it. After Moses came Joshua. They entered the promised land. Set up there and went generation after generation. Uh, but before that, while they were still in the, uh, in the wilderness, Moses, these, uh, this massive amount of people uh, were coming to him for uh, judgment on their disputes. And his father-in-law came and said, you know, Moses, this is too much for you. Uh, a point seventy elders to try the cases and then the most difficult ones they can bring to you. So this was set up and then later we find as uh, during Jesus time where they were under Roman rule they were allowed uh, the Jewish people uh, a certain amount of self-rule and the self-rule the Congress was a group of 70 elders giving insight onto where uh, Nicodemus was. A divided kingdom. This kingdom, as they entered the promised land, took it over after Joshua there became uh, uh, the rule of the, uh, the judges. I, it was a really messy time, a messy time where people did what they thought was right in their own minds. And for the most part, they were wrong. But I, you know, that's people, that's us. You know, remember, hold up the mirror. Uh, they struggled. Then they asked for a king. They got a king, Saul, not so good. They got David, up and down, but a man after God's own heart. Then you had uh, uh, Solomon, started good, did not end well. Then the kingdom was divided. The kingdom was divided. You had uh, uh, the southern kingdom, which was Judah, still based in Jerusalem, so they would... uh, celebrate the uh, three big festivals, including Passover, there in Jerusalem, the ten tribes broke off. They broke off, and they had uh, their center of worship in Samaria. So people did not go to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. Now, uh, In July, we talked about uh, the record of these kings. Southern Kingdom, not a bad record. Uh, You know, maybe four or five out of uh, 19 or 20 were good kings. Northern Kingdom, not so good. They were 0 for 19 with the kings. Yeah, uh, really, really bad. And so, uh, God allowed the Assyrians to come and take them over. And as they had done this, they, uh, uh, at that point, and then uh, even because of their unfaithfulness, Southern Kingdom lasted a bit longer before the Babylonians came and took them. So, uh, as things draw in, to the time of Jesus, 
you have three areas. You have Judea, the southern kingdom, as, they, uh, as the, the people came back over the centuries uh, to live there, you had the southern kingdom, Judea, center of worship in Jerusalem. You had Samaria, which was the capital of the northern kingdom. They did not celebrate the festivals still. In uh, Jerusalem, they had their own area, and they had developed a very twisted form of Judaism. But then you had the rest of the northern kingdom, which was Galilee. That's where Jesus grew up, but it was not seen as uh, you know, because of the tainted nature of their history uh, was not seen anywhere near uh, Judea. Born anew. So if you want to turn, turn to John chapter 3. We get to the modern times, modern Jesus times, where we have various groups of people, schools of thought from a religious standpoint, and also from a political standpoint. You have the Sadducees, uh, who didn't believe in life after death. That's why they were sad, you see. Okay, yeah, I, I could not resist that one, but uh, maybe I should have. Uh, they were really tied to the temple worship and, uh, and to the written teachings of Torah, of the Bible. They, uh, uh, most of the priests, well, all the priests... And they were, had uh, a closer relationship with Rome. As I mentioned, uh, Rome ruled, but they were allowed a certain degree of self-rule, but the priests uh, uh, were a bit more closely tied uh, to Rome. You had, uh, and the kingdom, uh, such that it was, was as big, big as it was when Solomon reigned. So you had, uh, had that. But Jerusalem and Judea had been ruled, and the whole area had been ruled by Herod the Great. But then uh, his sons took over, but the one in Judea was deposed, and Pilate was put in, a Roman governor. So they were kind of tight with him, but still an awkward uh, relationship. Then you had another group called the Pharisees, the Perush. They held to the written word, but also the oral teachings. So there was this uh, you know, culture of teaching. They believed in life after death. Uh, they believed... And this may sound familiar that if we could get everybody to get back to following God's rules, we'll be blessed and the Romans will go away and we'll have, uh, have our nation back. These were sincere people. They wanted the nation to be pure. Now, Jesus called them out many times because their hearts were not right. Their hearts were not there. But that was not the case for all of them. And now we get to John chapter 3. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. 
So he was part of that political uh, 70, likely. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs unless you, these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Amen. Yes. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Sometimes people give Nicodemus a hard time for coming at night. I believe he wanted a personal interaction with Jesus and, and wanted to tell him that he knew that the power came from God. He also, I believe, did not want it to be a free-for-all uh, where everybody, he wanted a quiet discussion with Jesus. But it is done under cover of darkness. But we do see here that Nicodemus is one of the rulers of the nation. In verse 9, Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we've seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I've told you earthly things you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of of man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Amen. Amen. We find that Nicodemus is not only a ruler. Jesus refers to him as the teacher of Israel. Yet he's not getting it. He's thinking tangibly. Where Jesus is saying, it's about the heart. It's about the water. It's about being washed. It's about the spirit being touched by the spirit of God. Nicodemus isn't getting it. And then we get to the famous John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Yes, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. Through him, whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe in him is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. This is the judgment that light has come into the world. And people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. 
For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come into the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out by God. We do know that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So all of us fall in that category of our works being evil. Even the good works, we're told, are nothing unless they're from God. And so we see. And then, then we're left here. We don't get any indication of Nicodemus' response. But Jesus gives him time, gives him space. And I think that's good advice for us as we share this incredible good news with our friends and the people we come in contact with. Sometimes we need to give them room to reflect because Nicodemus, obviously a good man, a good man is not processing this that it's a spiritual transaction. It's not about the rules. So we can turn to John 7, starting with 40. We see Nicodemus once again. When they heard these words, some of the people said, now, these words are Jesus' words. Jesus is out there preaching, teaching, doing miracles. And it's drawn the ire, especially of the Pharisees. Sadducees weren't so, uh, so cool with it either, but especially the Pharisees but all the religious establishment. And so uh, they charge some of the police to go uh, bring Jesus in. So we pick it up here in John 7. When they heard these words, some of the people said, this really is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So there was division among the people over him. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. See, yeah, see the struggle with... Uh, Jesus grew up in Nazareth in Galilee, and they couldn't process this. Not even Galileans could process it uh, very well. The officers then came to the chief priests and the Pharisees, so the Sadducees and the Pharisees, who said to them, why did you not bring him? The officers answered, no one ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees answered them, Have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. What a terrible thing to say. Nicodemus who had gone to him before, who was one of them, said to them, does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? They replied, are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises 
from Galilee. So he, he, uh, Nicodemus gets slammed too. You know, that's yeah. Nicodemus, they're starting to take a stand for Jesus, but he's still reflecting. He's still looking. The people don't believe him. The Pharisees really look down on the people, calling them accursed. How terrible. But that's what people do. So you have Jesus. Just as he had foretold and told his closest followers, I'm going to be arrested, tried, turned over to the authorities, be executed. And it was clear that he was to be executed not by the Jewish style or proscribed, which was stoning. It was to be the Roman style, crucifixion. Crucifixion, uh, I've heard, did not start with the Romans, but was uh, enhanced and perfected by the Romans. It was des uh, designed to be embarrassing, shameful, agonizing, time-consuming, and showy. It was to be a demonstration of Roman power and influence to be hung in the Jewish culture was extremely shameful. And there too, as well, it was thought to be a curse on the land if someone was left hanging after sundown. But Jesus is led to the cross. Pick it up in John 19. So they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. When you see the Son of Man lifted up, do you think Nicodemus saw? Yes, I do. Pilate wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Aramaic, and in Latin and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let's not tear it, but cast lots for those uh, to see whose it shall be. It was to fulfill the scripture, which says, they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. They cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus, were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, 
he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. To me, an interesting sidelight. There's uh, one male there, number of women. Uh, it's thought that the rest of the disciples and the disciple uh, whom Jesus loved is likely the writer, John. Uh, the rest of the other disciples had scattered. They had failed. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, to fulfill scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with, with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you may also believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones would be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. They were racing against time. The Jewish leaders wanted the bodies down. After that, they didn't care. Uh, typically, those who were crucified uh, were then, when they expired, were thrown into a common grave. That was, uh, and there's evidence of these uh, common gra uh, graves around. You have the sun setting. Sabbath is coming, but not just any one, but a real special one because it was the day of preparation. At the end, where everyone had to be pure in order to participate in the Passover celebration. This was one of the big three feasts. This was as important as anything else. So they were racing against time to get the bodies down and get them out of the way. Or I have to. This next section is incredible. So let me take a second to gather myself. Okay, yeah. Uh, after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he may take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. 
So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was buried, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have everlasting life. Joseph and Nicodemus racing against time. Nicodemus seeing the Son of Man being lifted up is willing to throw away everything. His position, his government position, there's no way because Nicodemus, now it's not clear whether Nicodemus was with Joseph when they went to Pilate. It's, it's important to remember that uh, earlier when the Jewish leaders came to Pilate, they made Pilate come out so that they would not be in close contact with a Gentile, with a non-Jew, so that they could stay pure for Passover. They likely sent word to have the legs broken. But it appears clear here that Joseph goes into Pilate, making him unclean for Passover. But then you have Nicodemus, who was also there, Nicodemus, handles Jesus' dead body, making him unclean for Passover. Nicodemus has thrown everything away to honor and follow Jesus. Nicodemus then finally understands that he needs to be washed, that he needs to believe. He'd made that spiritual transaction. And the 75 pounds of myrrh and aloes, some estimate that, that the worth of that in today's dollars was about 150 to 200 thousand dollars. He threw away his position as a ruler. He threw away his position as a teacher. He threw away his possessions to follow Jesus. As we celebrate New Life Day, let's see Jesus in a new and fresh way to see what he did for us and what he asks from us, which is, uh, may take different forms with different people, but he says, whomever believes, and it's believing is not just accepting that it happened, but truly uh, believing and embracing it, allowing us to be cleansed and to be touched with his spirit. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you. In obedience to the Father, you, Jesus, went to the cross. You went to the cross for us. 
And what's so exciting as well is that you proved that you had conquered death by rising from the grave, giving us new life if we put our full trust in you. So, Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, may we more fully appreciate what you've done for us. And if any of us have, uh, have not truly embraced that yet, that we not just celebrate New Year's, but celebrate new life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.